I'm John Kosmoski. Welcome to Custom Painting Made Easy. During this program, I'm going to share with you my 47 years experience as a custom painter. We're going to take an old gray car and turn it into a fine jewel. I'll teach you techniques that will give you pride in creating a quality job. One that will impress your friends. Using House of Color products and the tricks that we're going to teach you, your work will get so good, customers are going to beat a path to your door. Here's our subject vehicle, a 1977 Camaro. Spent his entire life in Southern California. We don't expect to find rust on this car, but we are going to have to disassemble it, and it has been refinished once other than factory. So we don't know what we're going to find underneath. Look at how hideous the bumpers are. We're going to paint the bumpers to match. We're going to remove the side moldings, top and bottom. We're going to remove the emblems so we've got a nice clean look. We're going to black out the grill and headlight doors. It'll change the look of the car. We'll change the wheels and tires, but we've got to get the paint off. So the first thing we're going to do is double tape all the seams around the doors and windows and so that we don't get any paint remover to run in there. We're going to use this aircraft stripper. It's an economical way to strip a car. You need to have safety factors in place. Methylene chloride, when it gets on the skin or gets in the eyes, can do serious damage. So we wear gloves, we wear eyeglasses, and it does have an odor to it. It doesn't even hurt to wear a respirator at this point in time because this stuff can nauseate you when you breathe it. But look at how it takes the paint off. It's amazing how it'll react. Now because it's got two paint jobs on it, don't expect one application to remove it all. Brush in one direction because there's paraffin in the system that comes to the surface and allows the biting chemicals to go down and remove the coating. This is important. Don't brush like this back and forth. It upsets the paraffin and you won't get the biting quality out of the stripper that you want. Now there are other ways to strip a car other than chemical remover, but it works well. Now use a scuff pad or three or four numbered steel wool and that will activate the stripper and help it after a certain length of time to remove the rest of the paints. And then squeegee it off so that it doesn't make a big mess on your floor and put it into a cardboard box that's had the bottom taped. That really makes your cleanup a lot easier. Using rubber squeegees to get it off, it's going to take a couple of applications. But there we go, we've got most of it off. Now we final wash it down with a solvent wipe. I prefer acetone because it evaporates quick and it's a very good cleaner. Now you'll notice we don't have all the spots. We're certainly going to have to DA the metal to get a good etch in it. Now we've stripped everything with the exception of the front group. Because they're made of plastic, the paint remover may affect and dive into those and cause some damage. You'll notice the paint left at all the openings that we had masked off. We simply take some 80 grit to remove this remaining paint. We did this to prevent the remover from going inside those jam areas, which can really be a mess. Now we've got to assess our bodywork. Here we noticed they had drilled holes to pull a dent and neglected to weld them. We've got to deal with that. So we go in and knock the plastic filler that's been applied out of those holes. Now it's not enough just to drill them out and weld them up. We want to make sure that our welds stay. And the way to make that happen is using a countersinking tool. We just countersink the edges so our welds will have a great edge to hang on to. Look at how nice that chamfers those out. Now we do that to every hole we're going to weld on the body, including where the emblems were, where the moldings were, before the welding takes place. Now prior to doing the welding, we need to clean the metal. We want to make sure we've got a nice clean surface. I highly recommend using a 24 grit 5 inch high speed grinder. But don't run it at high speed, just run it fast enough to clean the adjacent metal. Body work is in the hands. This is the wrong way. You need to lay the hand flat and move it back and forth and you don't even have to look at the area. The hand will tell you what's high and what's low and you need to train yourself to be able to use your hands to feel the body. Now we're going to weld up our holes using a welder that's designed specifically for sheet metal. You could also gas weld the holes using braze. Put the ground on, 
Put on your suit, protect yourself. It welds quick, puts on minimum build, uses reduced heat, a little or no warpage with a wire feed. Now we come in with a 24 grit grinder and we grind the high points off. We're also cleaning up metal on other areas that we have not yet welded. This also works to remove the high points from the old molding clips. Get rid of those. And then we're going to clean up the area that we know needs body work. Here we've got a gloved hand, but a rag will do the same thing. Now with a 24 grit super sander, we're going in. You could also use a big 9 inch grinder as well. Many painters and body men prefer to use the big grinder. But I like the little ones for small work. It's working well in this area. Make sure that all of the metal gets scratched. If you see points that aren't getting scratched, angle the grinder into those areas to make sure. This is what's going to give you the adhesion qualities that we need for the plastic filler that's coming next. Now when you want to put on as little plastic filler as possible, so we need to make sure that we've got the metal where we want it. Using a small grinder to get those small spots, even a die grinder on certain areas to make sure that they're good and clean. There's a high spot. We're going to deal with that by using a spoon which spreads the load. Hammer the spoon, it doesn't put small dents in, it knocks down larger amounts of metal so that we've got it the way we want it before the filler begins. Again, checking with the hand. Once you've got the areas cleaned and ready, it's time for filler. Now mixing the filler is critical. You need a clean flat board. You need to knead the hardener to make sure that the benzoyl peroxide is well mixed in. This is critical. Many body men and painters miss this step. Laboratory testing has shown the benzoyl peroxide in the hardener to begin separating within four hours. Putting in the right amount of hardener in the filler is, is critical. They do have a color guide that makes sure that you get the right amount in. Keep that guide handy when you're doing your mixing if you're new at this. Here we put on what we think is needed. And don't chop at the filler like this. This puts air bubbles in it. The right way is hard medium, light, hard, medium, light. And you're doing this much faster when I'm actually mixing. I'm slowing down so you can see the action. And then I'll squeegee down to the board and get it off of my squeegee completely, even taking off the edge to make sure that there's no plastic filler that goes unmixed. It's all got to touch the hardener. And you keep doing this until it looks uniform. The minute you're satisfied with the look, the uniform look, you can begin putting it on the car. Now what we're doing is working out air bubbles by mixing it this way. And we put it on the car the same way, using hard pressure and squeegeeing it down. Air bubbles can be horrendous when you've got a paint job that's got plastic filler in it with air bubbles and that starts to show on your paint job, not a good thing. Now we're very careful to put it on evenly and don't put on too much. It goes on a lot easier than it comes off, I'll tell you that. And you don't want to work harder than you have to. The idea is using the hand, know where to put it, the heaviest, and then squeegee it on as nice and even as you possibly can because it reduces your sanding time. The better job you do of putting the filler on, the least amount of work you're going to have taking it off. Now you notice I'm going the other direction here. There's no reason not to back up because whatever way you pull that filler is the way it goes. Now we're going to use a dustless sanding system here because we don't want dust all over the shop or in our nose. Simply wear the good safety equipment, the goggles, whenever you're using tooling. Protect yourself. Now we'll put the sandpaper down on the mud hog. This is made by Hutchins and it's designed to have the paper punched. And when you punch the paper, it lets the vacuum pick up the sanding residue so you don't see the dust flying around the shop. It's really nice to have a tool like this. 
and these really remove the filler fast. We're using 40 grit here. You could also use 36 grit. So whenever I'm working the mud, I generally use 36 or 40 grit. Again, a gloved hand or a hand with a rag in it. Remember, we don't want to transfer oil to the bare metal. That can cause delamination. Try to keep bare skin contact to an absolute minimum at all times during the paint job. Sandpaper manufacturers are now making this sandpaper with existing holes punched. That saves you the time of doing that punching. Now we do use tooling because tooling saves time and time is money in the shop. Here we're using a power blocker to help block sand with speed. But remember, this only goes back two inches, back and forth. Our hand, when we use a hand block, we can go back and forth a full foot or more. And so certainly hand blocking at the final is the only way to go. And that's what we're doing here. We're coming in now and hand blocking. And there's no reason not to guide coat at this stage if you wish. You can use a little primer, contrasting color, spray a little of that on there when you're blocking to see where the high and low spots are. But they're showing up rather well. When you start hand blocking, everything starts to come home. You'll start to find out what's high and what's low. And then by using the hand, the gloved hand or the rag in your hand and feeling back and forth, it tells you right where you are. And we X the block. Do you notice how we were doing that? Xing one way, Xing the other way, but holding the block. There's a low spot. You can see that it's not being sanded. Different size blocks for different areas. We'll use the longer block for the big flat areas. This is critical. We want this bodywork to be dead flat. If it's not, it's going to show up in our paint. Now we know we have to add extra plastic filler. So now we're going over it with a regular DA sander with 80 grit. We're putting a scratch in all the metal so that we know wherever we put the filler, it's going to stick because we've created that tooth. And this is where a lot of painters make mistakes. You know, you have to put a tooth in that metal if you're going to put something on it and you want it to stick. You can't forget this part. This is critical. We're going to wind up DAing the entire car. In fact, many body men and painters begin with that 80 grit right from the beginning before they even scratch other parts of the metal for excessive body work. It also shows up body work points, high and low spots, when you're using that DA tool. But nothing beats the hand. All right, remember to blow down between ads to get everything out of those grooves so that we've got a good scratch pattern for the succeeding coats of filler. Wipe it down real well before you mix the next batch. Now we're putting on a skin ad. The first ad got us very, very close. We just want to put on a light skin ad to complete this for the final hand blocking. Notice how hard I'm squeegeeing it down. It barely wants to go there. I'm pulling so tight on the squeegee. This is the way to go. We want this thing flat and nice. This will be our last ad. We're doing it everywhere where we feel we need it. The welding created some warpage in some areas we had to deal with. Now if there's severe low spots, you can use the stud welders to pull those up so we don't put holes in the metal. Clean up your mixing pad and squeegee with acetone immediately after it's added to the car. Then when you go to reuse it, it's ready to go. There's no rough spots that can cause bad mixing. Now we've let it harden up. I don't like my plastic filler to get super hard. If you come in when it's partially cured with some very coarse sanding paper, 36 grit, 40 grit, it sands real easy. Use the small blocks for getting into the tight spots to make the curvature out to this fender lip. Double check yourself. Now I like to take some 80 grit and put it on a block and take the tops off to of the plastic filler before I come in with my spray filler or my primer. This reduces the amount of filling that's required. But don't try to finish it completely out with 80 grit. That would be a mistake. You work too hard sometimes and go nowhere. Now we're pretty much ready. We've got so much body work on the side of this car, we've decided to use a spray filler. And there are many different companies that make spray fillers. 
and they're very high solid polyester based and they really put some millage on probably four times more per coat than a primer would and we're going to do that just strictly to the bodywork areas so that we get one more chance to block everything now blow it down real good wipe it down again with a good final wash solvent don't use tar wax and grease remover at this stage because many of those tar wax and grease removers will soak into the filler and can cause you severe problems make sure the product you're using is stated as a final wash now we make one called KC20 that's a very good one De Beer is an excellent European automotive paint company specializing in standard colors we're going to use their polyester spray filler spend time stirring the hardener in in the can do not put these products on a shaker the heat generated will cause them to kick use a paint gun designed specifically for heavy fillers one that preferably has a 1.8 to 2.2 nozzle needle combination fiberglass evercoat also makes a finished sand material that is a polyester based spray filler many other companies make these products the only time we use them is when a car has extensive body work such as this car and we're going to put two to three coats on just the bodywork areas so that we can give it another good block prior to priming. We don't do this always, but in particular cases we will. And this car had extensive bodywork. We want it right. Take your time, put on nice, even wet coats. Don't mix more than you can use you can't keep it and make sure to get it out of the gun and clean the gun thoroughly before 15 minutes have gone or it'll kick in the gun guide coats are now available in aerosols but you can also use the powdered material from 3m or in my case i use old lacquer number 70 that i still have a little left of in an old paint gun and just dust a coat of that it's the only place that lacquer is used anywhere in automotive refinish today. I don't use lacquer putties or anything like that. As we said before, if they can be moved by solvents, we certainly don't want them in or around our job. We want a job that's gonna last. So we get the guide coat everywhere and set up our blocks with coarse paper. Generally nothing finer than 100 grit. I prefer 80 actually. Now this is a DA that you can use, it's got 80 grit and you can also use the inline orbiting block sanders and they work fine in certain applications. This is not the final sand so a DA can be used properly held but I prefer to block because the blocking tells me exactly what I need. Now we need to clean our blocks well with a, with a straight edge razor blade, make sure that they're clean because if you've got an irregular surface and you're putting paper on it, you're not getting a true block. We're using 80 grit. It's a no-fill grade, available with sticky back on a roll. Many paint manufacturers offer it. Then with a long block, we're going to do our cross blocking and check out our body work now. This will tell us what kind of a job we've done. Many times you hit it the first time, but here we're hitting metal and we've got a low spot around it so we don't have perfection yet we're working towards it using the xing motion but keeping the block facing front to back the only time we make a turn is when the curve goes down like it does on the deck lid now again blocking again and again and again it's amazing how much fill you get with this spray filler now we can kind of see the spots that we know we have to add small amounts of putty to. A catalyzed spray putty could be used again, but it's actually quicker to use a small spot putty that's designed specifically for nothing thicker than an eighth of an inch. And it dries immediately. You practically have to run to the car after it's mixed. It sets that quick. By the time I've got it added, and clean my mixing paddle I can get back to it and begin to sand it so it doesn't hold up our progress hardly at all but it's important we want to finesse these ads in on these little low spots 
The primer might get him, but we're not going to take that chance. There, we've got our spots covered. As fast as we cleaned our paddle, we're back now with 80 grit, and we're blocking this. You don't have to wait for it to thoroughly cure. If it's not thoroughly cured, many times it'll just seed the paper up. Check your paper and you can tell real quickly whether or not it's cured enough. But it cures in five to eight minutes, it's that fast. Now we've got it. We've filled in our low spots and we're good to go. Now we're using that orbital block in the curved areas. It saves time. And it's all about time. Your shop time is what people are paying you for. If you can make it go faster, that's money in your pocket. Now we're hand blocking to get our body line back. I'm watching the guide coat carefully. Notice I'm using a long block here. But when I get forward of the quarter panel, I switch to a smaller block. So I'm more comfortable with that curve. You notice I'm not doing the flare out to the fender at all until I go to a round block. The square blocks would put a groove in there and we can't take that chance. So here we are Xing our blocking again over the fender opening to get a nice continuity going on here. Now our body line doesn't quite match the door. Bring in a small block and spend time lining up those marks. We want it to be right. Now coming from the bottom we can again make sure that our peaks are correct. That's a big part of doing the body work, making sure the body lines work. Now we're ready for our primer, so we're masking off inside the door jams. We're masking our break areas because we don't want to get paint on those areas, that's for sure. What a mess to try to clean that up. Anything we don't want the primer to go on, and that epoxy primer likes to stick to things. We're cutting a hole so we can open the door to go inside the door and primer the bodywork areas that we've got inside the jams. We're folding our rag into a square and wiping it down with a final wash. And make sure you're not using a tar wax and grease remover here. We want to see it labeled final wash. That's important. Sometime residue can be left from certain wash materials. Now we're shaking our primer, part A, part B one-to-one -one mix. Our KP2CF stands for chromate free, part A and part B. Both parts have filler in them and you want to spend time making sure that they're well mixed. Now there's no incubation time required with this primer. The quick cure sets up the minute the two meet each other. The old EP2, if you remember, had a 30 minute incubation time. So we're putting two 24 ounce cups of the part A and we're going to match that with two 24 ounce cups of the part B and remember both sides have filler in them put the lids back on the can when you're done pouring out of it it's hard to pour out of a new gallon as long as I've been doing it I still screw up once in a while even after you've got the first quart out or the first uh, pour the second pour can still run down the back of the can matter how hard we try. That's why we use a steel mixing bench. You can keep it clean and neat. Now, put the lid on, put it on the shaker for just a few minutes, not even two. Doesn't take very much. If you're using the crystal tack cloth, open it up all the way into a full opening because we want it to cure a little bit. We want the resin to dry up so it doesn't smear onto the vehicle. If you're using the new style tack rags, uh, these don't require this because their sticky material is on the inside of the rag and they're not designed to be opened up. Now we treat our primer just like paint. We strain it to make sure there's no lumps in it. We make sure that we paint the car just like we're painting it as if we were using paint. This is where we begin to train ourselves on how we're going to paint this object. We air and tack the car carefully to get all the lint off. And be sure to do the paper as well. We consider that part of the car. If there's lint on the paper, it's going to get off on the job. So tack everything. Save your tack rag in an old coffee can. It keeps it viable and keeps it tacky. Check your pattern. Figure out what your increment of overlap is going to be with a 50% overlap. Do your banding. Make sure you get all the edges. 
put on a nice medium coat to begin with and we'll start wetting it after this. How many coats of primer? I like three coats on the bare steel and two extra coats on the bodywork. So the way I generally do it is put a coat on the bodywork first. But in this case, we've already used the spray filler, so I'm just going to apply three coats to the main overall car. I'm not going to do any extras. Walk the length. This is where we begin training ourselves for applying the candy paint job. Start learning to do that walk. There's nothing difficult about it except hose management. You need to know where that air hose is at all times. You need to hold the hose properly so it doesn't slap the side of the car. These are all important parts of the paint job. But hose control is a big part of it, particularly when we get into the candy and we're walking up and down a ladder to do a perfect paint job on that roof. Don't be afraid to bend down and get down on your knees to make sure you get primer underneath. It's never a bad idea to have a knee pad on outside your painter's suit, a lightweight knee pad. They work great for dropping down to your knees to make sure you're getting those low areas of the car. Overgrip the gun. Maintain parallel as much as possible. You won't put a run in anything with a good pattern overlap. Making sure you're doing that right. Holding the gun properly at the right angle. It's funny how well things work when you're that robot. I want you to think like a robot when you're in there putting this primer on and talk to yourself like that. I'm a robot, I'm a robot. We've got the primer on and it's set for 14 hours. We're guide coating it. If you put a lot of primer on, it's not a bad idea to let it sit even longer. Up to 24 hours is recommended. You can tell if the primer's not cured right because it'll start to gum up your sandpaper when you're sanding it you'll get seeds. That doesn't happen when the primer's cured. And this primer doesn't shrink. Another good thing about it, not only does it adhere super well and has tremendous flexibility, but it sticks like glue. All right, now we're going to our wet sanding stage, which is the final stage before the sealer. We fold the sandpaper in half, tear it in half, and do the three fold. The reason for this, we want to do all the folding before it goes into the water because the paper will curl up in the water and we're supposed to soak it a minimum of 20 minutes prior to use to soften the back. Now you can see by doing the three-fold method how well the pads fit inside there. Even the small pads and the larger pads go into this fold perfectly and that's great for the big flat areas. The reason for the three-fold is that we can use random sanding pattern and you'll see when we do the second this is I use mainly on motorcycles, but it works for small areas. Tear the halves in half, fold them, interlock them. The reason for doing this is we can make different side motions and the sandpaper does not roll out of your hands because of the way you folded it. Now it can go in the water and soak. I don't use ivory liquid when I sand the primer. Kingspur out of Germany also makes a sticky back wet sanding paper and I use their 320P grade for sanding the primer. It's very sticky as you can see when you make a mistake on the pad it's hard to get it off. Make sure your pad is clean and put it down and it works so good. Keep it wet, well lubricated. Use the X method that we used through the whole sanding process on the bodywork and everything else. The guide coat shows you your blocking errors, the low spots. Just keep blocking till they're gone. Because of all the previous work that we've done, we know that this primer is going to get us where we want to be. Each dried wet coat of primer should put on one mil. So that means we've got three mils of primer on there. Check your work with a squeegee. You can actually use the squeegee that goes inside the sandpaper to squeegee it off. Now we're using the half round to complete our wet sanding in the areas that were concave. And that's important. We don't want any grooving in there now because it's going to be picked up on our paint job. Use blocks when it makes sense, but use common sense. We've sanded the whole car, gotten rid of all of our guide coat, and now we're going to begin our layout. The first thing that we have to do is find center. And then using two inch tape on either side of center, 
That's going to be our gap between our layout. Our goal here is to put Yenko style stripes on the hood and the trunk. And we're going to measure the back of the hood to make sure we get it even. We're going to check our curves to make sure that the layout is identical. It's amazing how much you can do with eyeball, but a tape measure doesn't lie. And you want to make sure you've got it right. Use small pieces of tape to mark your areas. Or you can use a greaseless pencil like a Stabilo, which also works and doesn't affect any paint application. Here I am using the tape to mark a spot, so I get it equal from one side to the other. Nothing will make you sicker than doing a layout and finding out it's not the same from one side to the other. Measure the hood edge, get it right. A little time spent here really comes back to you in the long run. Now when we're crossing a hood opening or a door opening, you can also come in and pop the hood open and tape those edges so that the design continues through the open hood. This really shows fine detail and that's what we're doing here to make sure that our design goes through. You can also do that in the jams if you're being paid for it. It does take extra time and the customer has to understand time is money. All right. We, on the Yenko stripes, they had a main stripe and then a quarter inch stripe that encircled it. So we use a quarter inch piece of tape as a guide and then use the plastic tape around the outside. Most of our taping here, as you're seeing, we're doing with the crepe tape. But you can use the plastic or the crepe. They work equally well. The reason the crepe tape works with our base coats is they're not prone to creep underneath the crepe tape like some paint companies' base coats are. Now we mask out. We do the trunk, we do the hood, and we get to looking at the job and we think, you know something? It'd sure look nice if we had stripes across the top. Yanko never did that, but we decided, yep, we're going to add stripes across the top. Find center. Again, the most important part of the layout is finding center, whether it be a motorcycle or a car. And then we've done our tape out on the roof, something that looked well, that worked. We had to taper it a little in the rear to match the rear trunk. We did that. Now we're doing our final wipe down with a final wipe and we're going to mix our sealer. The three bases that we're going to use on this car are the MBCs. And they're super metallics. They're beautiful. But we need to put a, a sealer under each one of them that matches. The first one we're going to use is the black diamond. And that requires a black base. The mixing ratio on the sealer is 411. Take a look at your mixing vessel. Take a look at the highest number. For example, we're going to go to number four. The highest number four is the, the total amount we're going to have mixed. We add the sealer, the catalyst, and the reducer to bring it to those marks. Don't guess. Everything we do must be measured. The second number four can either be our catalyst or our reducer. We choose to use reducer. There is no sequence on when it's mixed. We hit the second number four. Now we get the catalyst and we're going to do the third number four, which will give us our ratio of 411. Bring it to the last four. There we are. Now all we have to do is mix. See that four line runs across? We hit the four line. That's what's important strain into the gun. We treat it like paint. Make sure there's no lumps in it. We're using the bag system here from Devilibus to prevent gun drips. And it siphons down. It allows us to paint at different angles without worrying. Using our fluffed tack rag that we've let dry, we're going in and tacking all the lint off from the rags we use for wiping the vehicle down. Checks and balances. Now we're going to set our pattern. By turning our air cap vertical, we get a horizontal pattern. We can now measure this and know exactly how wide our pattern is at our given painting distance. This tells us how much our increment is. In this case, about two inches. Make sure we get good coverage. Do the band pass. Make sure we get good coverage. Paying attention to our increment of overlap, Putting on the nice wet coat, we do the roof, finish the hood. All we need is one good coat. 
Remember, the paint doesn't turn the corner. We as painters have to make it turn that corner. Always remember that. You must do the van. Notice that I'm shooting at that louver from the other side. The reason being, you can't angle the gun the right way to get paint on the back side of that louver. And that happens throughout this whole paint job. We're covered. This is the end of it. Now we'll go out and mix our base. How long should the sealer sit? I like it to sit for a minimum of 45 minutes to an hour. No longer. I don't believe in longer. I know our instructions say the sealer can sit longer, but common sense tells me get that paint on so it'll bond into that sealer while it's green and while it's receptive. These are the three bases available in the MBC, pale gold, platinum, and black diamond. We're using the MBC-03, the black diamond over our black sealer. One of the things you'll learn in custom painting is make sure that your sealer is near your base color. It saves you time and money and grief because things happen fast when the sealer match the top coats. Now we're using slow dry reducer here because on these super metallics, I really like them to lay down well. And if the reducer is a little bit slower, those sealers tend to lay down much nicer. Yeah, you'll have a little more time wait between coats, but it's worth it. The amazing thing about these sealers is how quick they cure. And these base coats are so metallic-y, but they go on smooth. They come across as a medium flake. Now look what we're picking up on our tack rag, tacking the sealer. Always a good idea to tack the sealer. Now that tack rag got pretty well trashed, but I'm gonna keep it anyway. I keep a couple of coffee cans, one with good tack rags and one with beater tack rags. Again, the band pass, tight pattern overlap. We set our pattern, we're moving the gun about an inch and three quarter, wetting out that base. We're gonna put three coats of base on. That's what's called for on the instructions. Three nice wet coats, allowing dry between each. Using invisible straight lines, behaving like a robot, putting the paint on the best way we know how. We've again adjusted the gun. We leave the fan control wide, bring in the material knob for the pattern size that we want, check it on our pattern on the wall, and then begin our painting. This is fun. This is fun part of painting. Here's our last coat. Wetting it out. Tight pattern overlap. Keeping the gun parallel. All important. There's not a time to be casual. Now we're laying out the bottom half. Our goal here is to use all three of those bases. And we're going to use the Platinum, the MBC-02, from the brake line down on the side of the car. So I'm using a three-quarter inch roll of crepe tape, and I'm using that to set my design. Because the thicker tape gives me a nice straight pull. Eyeing it very carefully, setting it the way I want it, cutting it in the door jams. This is the material we're going to use. Now here's a little bit of a problem. We make a silver sealer, but we don't make a platinum sealer. We have to build our own. The platinum being darker, we have to take our metallic sealer and mix in some black. So we're using the KS11 and we're adding small amounts at a time of black to make a gray metallic sealer. Adding more black until I'm satisfied that it's dark enough. I want it slightly darker than the base, the platinum base. We're stirring the base, we're comparing it to our sealer. Yes, it's ready. It's slightly darker than our existing metallic. That's what we need. We go in and tack this area on the lower parts of the car 
and we go ahead and use the same 411 mixing ratio on the mix sealer. Strain it into our gun, check our pattern, and apply the sealer. You know, if there's a trick to custom painting, get that sealer near that base color. You'll save time, you'll save money, and the sealers are amazing what they do. They create a tremendous bond coat to the sanded primer. They work so good for that. And then on top of that, they give us the coloration that we want. I don't know of anyone else that makes a metallic sealer. And that metallic sealer is a real workhorse, as you'll see as we continue through this job. Make sure you get your wheelhouse as well. Make sure you get the tail sections. Get down on your hands and knees and make sure the rockers are well done. Now, we're mixing our metallic. You can also put on a second coat if you need it. Add a little extra reducer to that sealer. Now, this is a two to one mix on the platinum. Look at that. It looks like a medium flake, but it goes on so smooth, it'll blow your mind. Put it on wet. Use a medium dry reducer or a slower reducer to get it to lay down. Walk the length whenever possible. Don't stop at those door edges. That's a big mistake in the custom world. In fact, I find standard painters that paint cars for a living have learned a long time ago. Walking the length of the car gives them a better paint job and definitely reduces the chances of runs. All right, parallel that air cap. Get down, get those lower areas, man. That's important. Notice the knee pads, rubber knee pads. Don't want to be kneeling on direct concrete when you're doing the body work, when you're doing anything. It's not good for the knee cartilage. It'll cause you big problems later in life. Best to take care of yourself. Three good coats, just like we did on the Black Diamond. Put it on nice and wet. Notice I always hold the gun fairly close. When you start moving the gun too far away, it goes out of the control of the air horns on the gun, and it just starts splashing the paint on the side of the car. A quality painter adjusts his gun down using the material knob so that you can DN control up close. We've got two of the bases on now. Now we can pull the tape. How long do you wait? Generally 30 to 45 minutes. The idea is to pull the tape away and ahead. Now that's a little bit of an error there, but notice how I'm doing it with the outline. I'm pulling it ahead and away. We've got all the tape pulled off now, and now we have to reverse tape. In other words, everything that's got the base on it now, we're gonna put tape on because we need to protect it so that we can put on our last and final base, which is the pale gold. Do you understand what we're doing here? We're butting the bases together so that there's no one base is thicker than the other. All of the base coats are gonna come out at the same millage so that when we put our candy job over the top of all of this, there's only gonna be one gauge of base coat throughout the whole car. Fold your paper. Eliminate the amount of tape contact to those bases. Now SG100 could be used over those base coats before the tape is pulled, and many smart painters do that. We didn't do it in this case because there is no contrasting color that's going to hurt us here. But on motorcycle tanks and other things, SG100 can be a real workhorse to protect that surface. Now, for example, if I was going to lay flames out on one of those bases, before I did that, I would want my SG100 down, which is nothing more than a clear base coat, and that allows me to be able to sand errors. If you sand directly on a base, you're in deep trouble. Now, when you do your tape outs, always leave a little bit of the contrasting base showing, just enough to barely get a visual on it, and then you know you're not going to have any primer showing through. That's important on your tape outs. It takes a little time, but it goes fast. We're doing this whole job in one day. And so we started early and we've been going steady. Now we mask everything off carefully. You know, all the work goes into the preparation. The trigger time is fun. Now we need to mix a base that matches the pale gold. And using the KK14 Spanish gold and mixing one ounce into 24 ounces of the silver base coat makes a perfect pale gold base. Look at that. I mean, it's unbelievable. And that is going to make applying our pale gold so easy. 
it's going to take a couple coats of that because the first coat kind of models just a little bit we strain it like the paint everything we're going to do here is like we're painting the car set your pattern up first coat goes on kind of fast gun held close and what I do many times on the second coat is I go out to the paint bench and add another ounce of extra reducer. It's amazing what a little bit of reducer will do to take the modeling out of the sealer. We apply two coats of this, allow flash time between. How much flash time? Eight, ten minutes is generally enough in a shop that's at a normal painting temperature. I don't like to see any painting done in a shop below 70 degrees. It really, really reduces the amount of solvent that's pulled out of the film when the shop gets colder than that. Straight line thinking, become that robot that I want you to be. A custom painter is a robot when he begins doing the custom work. Don't let the converging panels trick you. Make sure you get in and turn the corners. Put the sealer where you need it. Don't miss any spots because they will haunt you if you do. When you start putting on that metallic, they almost don't cover at all. If they don't have a base under them, you're really in trouble. Getting our sealer on is critical. You can go a little faster for the second coat. Notice I don't go all the way back on the hood on that one pass. You have to read the job as you go and determine what's invisible straight lines you're going to use to get through the piece but the hoods are always wider at the back than they are in the front in most cars. Walking the length, key, key item. Learning how to control that air hose so you don't trip up on it. All important. Remember when you go by the front, paint everything that needs painting. Don't waste motion. Economy of motion. Save the time. There's enough work involved here without making more. Walk the length. Visible straight lines. This is fun. You know, there's nothing more fun than doing quality work. The pride of workmanship never goes away. And it's fun to master this craft. Take your time. You don't notice I'm not in a big hurry. I've got my gun set up so that I'm in control. Where is my concentration? I'm watching that primer sealer hit. I'm paying close attention to it. It's critical. You know, you can't be watching the ceiling. You want to watch that paint go on. I want to try and be as robotic as I can. I mean, I'm a human being and we all make mistakes, but I'm trying to do it as good as I know how. And if you think like a robot, you'll do this kind of work. You'll have great fun doing it. Nice short steps so you're not bouncing up and down. Watch that hose. I've always got it in control. I don't want it slapping the side of the car. Sealer is covered and looking even. All right, here we come with the base, the pale gold. 2-1-1 ratio. Gun set up. Wet it out. This is our last base coat. Wet it out. I'm going to put three coats on, just like we did the other two bases. Nice and wet. And it's amazing, the glitter of this material. Well, you can't appreciate it in a fluorescent light atmosphere, but when you see this car outside after it's painted with the candy on it, you'll know what I'm talking about. And it goes on so smooth. These bases, as I said, have that medium flake look without the work. There's no roughness. When the candy goes on, this paint job is going to be smooth. Don't forget your band passes at the edges of the windshield and the back glass. Don't forget that. Paint won't turn the corner. Notice I slightly tipped the gun at the front of that fender when I went by because of the way the curve of that sheet metal is. Subtle little moves to try and maintain parallel with that air cap. We 
do it here. Right there. Angle it in. Nice wet coat. So much fun to be a precision painter. You see this work happening right in front of your eyes. Doing the walk. Getting it on evenly. It's amazing how nice and even this face goes on. Using a tight pattern overlap, remember. 75% pattern overlap. I mean, there's some inconsistency in my distance as I walk. But the idea is, if you've got that locked in your mind, those don't mean a thing. Minor inconsistencies do not mean a thing, as you'll see as we complete the job. Here we go with our third and last coat. Nice and wet. Take your time. Adjusted the gun back, so I'm doing a full trigger pull each time based on my gun adjustment. Remember, that gun adjustment knob does nothing more than restrict the trigger pull. You get the same trigger pull each time because you did gun adjustments. And I know many painters that can't understand how I can paint this close. It's because I've adjusted the gun. If there's a secret, that's it. Final coats are happening. Doesn't take very much of this base to do the job either. It goes a long way, mainly because we've got the sealer that tones it out for us. I had one fella trying to put our platinum over a white base. It took him six coats. We had coverage or the look of coverage in one. And now what I like to do is take a dull pocket knife and just go along the edges that want to crawl up alongside the edge of the tape and get a little high spot there. Before we go to the candy coats and that paint is set up, you can just go along with a dull blade. A sharp blade won't work. It'll want to dig into the paint. But a dull blade will just go along and rake that stuff down and it really helps us in the overall job. It takes a minute you know at a section to go along the whole job but it happens fast it's really probably an hour total in the whole thing to cut all those edges down and now take a scuff pad I use a gray here but just a scuff pad and go along to make sure that none of those high metallics are sticking up if they are this will knock them down it's so all we want to do is get them knocked down before we begin the candy now we air off the excess Make sure you air at the window areas. Now, how many times do we mask a car? I like to remask after the primer, and I like to remask at this stage. It's not a bad time, but you can just put tape over the existing tape and trap all that metallic under tape. Works just as well as pulling all the tape off and retaping. Now, you might have a situation where the tape goes out onto the surface of the car. That's worth cutting off and retaping. Because, you know, urethane, when you start painting it, it starts to get leather-like. It gets so thick. Now, we're going to do a mix here of apple red and, and brandy wine. We're going to use a couple parts of apple red to one part of brandy wine. And why are we doing this? Well, the apple red has a yellow tone. The brandy wine has a blue tone. And this will make a cherry color. Beautiful combination. We're going to use fast dry reducer based on our shop temperature. We're using the mix. We get our mix done first before we catalyze or do anything. You don't want to catalyze too much at one time. Now we've got our uniform mixture. That's the candy color we're going to be working with. You could name it your own color if you wanted to because you're doing your own mix. And that's what custom painting's all about. Now the ratio on the candy is 2 one, one. Two parts of the paint or the candy color, which is a tinted clear to one part of catalyst to one part reducer. Now if you've read our label instructions it says on the beginning three coats it's recommended that you over reduce a little bit. In this case this is our over reducer over and above our measured spot. So to a gallon we're adding a couple of ounces two or three ounces of extra reducer. Look at how rich our candy is ready to spray. It's amazing how fast the color comes on. Again, pouring out of a 
new container, always seem to do a little spilling. We strain into the gun cup. Now, we're using a 1.2. You could also use a 1.3. You need good, clean air. We didn't talk about it earlier, but I like refrigerated dryers because they make sure to get the moisture out. Make sure you've got good filtration because you need to filter out anything that might want to fragment in your air lines. And you also need a filter that's going to filter out the oil molecules. When you've got a reciprocating air compressor, what's the reason we can't breathe it? Because of oil molecules. You need this type of a system to filter out the oil molecules, to take out the last little bit of water, and if you're going to use a breathing system in the booth with a hood, you need a separate system to make sure that that is clean, breathable air. And that's what we've got here with these filters. A 60 pounds, by the way, is recommended uh, on your hood so that you get enough clean, fresh air. Here's another system made by Sharp Manufacturing that has the coalescer for filtering out the oil. It's got a unit in it for filtering out the particles that might get into your air system. And it's got a dryer, a membrane dryer, that absolutely gets all the water out of the system. And it doesn't need to be recycled. It just goes on doing this forever. And so it's a worthwhile unit if you want to save some money compared to the refrigerated dryers. Now we're airing and tacking. This is the moment of truth, gang. Everything we've done up to now has been a lot of work to get to this point. And we could ruin everything if we hadn't done our practicing during our priming, during our base application. We pretty much have this job figured out. We know how we're gonna paint it. We know how we're gonna get there. Now we're getting hooked up. We're getting our breathing apparatus set on. Isocyanates are hazardous, and we wanna protect our skin. We wanna protect our lungs so that we can continue to do the work that we love for a long time. Now we begin by the band pass. You notice most of the painting, we never used a ladder. When it comes to the candy, we are gonna use a two-step with a hoop. And the reason for that hoop is so I can lock my legs into that and lean out and maintain parallel. Now we set the gun up. My increment of overlap is tight. It's about an inch and three quarters. I've got a six inch pattern, six inches from the gun. Notice how I try to get it perfect. I'm trying to be that robot. I'm concentrating on the paint hitting I'm doing that tight pattern overlap. I want this to be a nice, even, beautiful candy paint job. Notice my knees are locked into that hoop on the ladder, so there's no way I'm sticking my knees in this paint job. And this gets more serious as we progress through the job. Now I do that half of the roof and the sail area down to the quarter panel, and now I pick up that chair and move immediately to the other side. Also do the band passes along the back window light and along the front of the windshield. That's very important. Now don't overlap too much at the center. That can cause a stripe. Make sure that you're doing your proper increment even when you pick it up from the other side. We're taking the wet paint and we're carrying it off to this side. There are many ways to paint a car. This has been my method for all the years that I've been doing it. There may be other ways that work for you, that's fine. I'm showing you my way and what's worked for me. All right, do that sail area, get down off the ladder, get the ladder out of your road so it's not in your way. Don't forget to make that pass along that back window. Straight line thinking, watch this pass, doesn't go back all the way. Stop, now go back. I'm establishing a straight line using the deck lid as my straight line, the edge of the deck lid, using that robot attitude, straight line thinking, straight line thinking, proper increment of overlap, holding the gun parallel, taking my time, watching that candy go on the way I want it to go on, doing my banding. Whenever I'm there, I band all the edges. Go up on the inside, go up on the inside, get everything done. Don't forget that bottom pan. Get down and get those low areas. Too many times, look at that, a piece of tape I forgot. Get it out of there. Didn't hurt a thing. First coat of candy, no problem. 
All right, get down on those low areas. I've had more painters take cars outside after they're done and say, what do I do? I didn't get enough paint on the rocker. Continue, straight line, invisible straight lines. Hit where we came down to that sail area and stop. Band, important banding. Now we get up to the hood. We haven't done the sides yet. We're gonna complete the rear, we're gonna complete the hood, we're gonna complete the front, and then we're gonna walk the sides. Don't be afraid to help support that gun. If your hands start to get tired after a couple of paint jobs, bring that other hand in, help support that thing. We don't wanna see anything falling into the job, any, any deterrence from our robotic attitude. Do the wheel, do the openings here, around the headlights, around the parking lights, around the grill openings, everything that's needed. Economy of motion. When you're going by something, do the painting that's required. Get down. Get it done. Remember, the same problem can happen on the center of the hood by overreaching and making a stripe in the center of the hood. So when you get out there, pick it up at the right point so that we're maintaining the continuity that we want to. It takes extra effort to parallel that air cap. Make sure that you do that always. Using invisible straight lines, robot attitude. I am a robot. To this day, I say that. I am a robot. I am a robot. I'm going to paint this as if a robot were controlling me. If I had a program, I'm going to maintain my program. The walk begins now coming right off of this band pass on the curve of that fender, here we come. Take your time. Tight pattern overlap on the candies. This is not so hard. You can do this. Concentrate on the paint hitting. That's what tells you how fast to move. If you don't watch the paint hitting, you don't have any idea how fast to move. It's better to go too fast than too slow. You can always come back. But make, maintain that increment. I want to see that gun move. Now over grip when you start going below center because the sheet metal turns at a different angle. Maintain parallel. Finish between the two wheel openings. When half the pattern goes in the wheelhouse, it's always been my signal to complete between the wheel openings. Don't be afraid to get down on your knees and make sure that rocker panel is covered. Don't make the mistakes some painters do and make that error. Do the wheel openings. Get those well covered. Finish behind the wheel opening. We're walking the other side. It's so much fun to do a quality candy paint job, but it does take this type of concentration. Concentrate. Watch that paint hit. Control the hose. Maintain parallel. Aim the gun right. Because we've got the extra reducer in, this is going on so beautifully. Finish in front. Do the wheel opening. Do between the wheel openings. We're back on the roof. Now we can begin to slow down a little bit more. Start to wet it out a little bit. Remember that first coat over the base is a bond coat. And that first coat gives all the succeeding coats something to stick to and hang on to. Having the gun set up properly is a big item. If that's not right, nothing will be. The band pass at the back. Catching the trunk. You don't have to use the same startup point each time. You can alter that an inch if you want so that nothing is exactly the same when you, when you carry through. That's your call completely. Here we change in our methods. We're going all the way across the deck from one side. Getting all the inside low parts, getting around the deck lid, getting around the tail lights, going in and making those band passes. Make sure it's all covered, top and bottom. Paint won't turn the corner. We're turning the corner, making sure we get it where we want it. Bottom pan. Not rocket science. You guys can do this. 
We have to do it though, there's no wait. You know, once you start a candy job, it's a major commitment. Nothing can deter you. If you let this base candy sit too long, it can cure to the point that it'll wrinkle when you recoat it. So how long a wait between coats? I never want to see longer than 10, 12 minutes, and that's even pushing it. Use the touch test. If you touch it at the wet point and it strings up on your finger, it's still flowing. But if you touch it at a wet point and it's sticky to the touch and doesn't string, you're ready for the next coat. I generally do a lot of my testing at the center of the windshield. Seems to be a very wet point. You've seen this done. You can do this, particularly over the darker bases. The lighter bases are the most difficult. But our lightest base here is pale gold. The platinum would be a nice startup base. I think anybody could do a quality paint job over the black diamond. And it comes across as a black paint job until the sun hits it. It's amazing. What do you see what we're achieving here with this mix of candy? Get down on those bottom areas. Don't neglect that. How many coats? I want to see five to six coats of candy for long life. The lighter the base, the more important it is to have the maximum amounts of candy for long life. Now our candy contains 4% UV absorber, as does all of our clears except one. SG100, being a base coat clear, has no UV absorber. And that's important for the life of the job. Well, we got on our five coats of candy, and we finished it with two coats of clear. We used the UC35, which is our pure acrylic urethane clear. Now we're going to wet sand and dry sand our candy. Now we've got the clear coats on, so we're going to dry sand to show you some of the faster methods by using a 600 grit paper on a DA sander and using a scotch bright to periodically clean the pad we can go in and smooth out the edges from our artwork. No matter what you're always going to have some edging from the artwork and we're always going to have some nibbing. Dirt nibs happen when you're doing as much painting as we've done on this car. When you figure we put on one to two coats of sealer, three coats of base, five coats of candy, two coats of clear, I mean there's lots of chances for lint to get in there and they just become like little burrs they're not going to show when we've got them sanded smooth hit that light scuff pad keep the pad clean takes the seeds off how long has this job dried we finished it 16 hours ago it only had to cure 12 before we sanded it and recoat it now we're going to get all the mean parts of it done with the sander the dry but we'll still come in and wet sand with some 500 grit. We're using a block where we think it's necessary and this is a very flexible block. In other words it moves. It gets into the flexible areas but it also gets up close which is harder to do with our fingers without finger sanding. And then check yourself with a squeegee. Be careful of black squeegees on lighter colors because they have been known to leave black stripes. What's good to use is one of the foam pads that you use for sanding. They work great for squeegeeing the water off and they leave little or no chance of leaving a mark. What do we use to wipe down the car as we sand? Because we've used a little ivory liquid you can use water for clean and that's what we use for a final wipe down. After we've wet sanded the whole car and I watch carefully to make sure that the water goes everywhere if there's a place that the water won't go, there's something contaminating that area. Keep the bucket in the booth with the ivory liquid in it and, the, and a little 500 sandpaper and go back over that area and sand it and wipe it down and now come back with the pure water. I like the water to be warm. The main reason I use warm water is it evaporates and wipes up quickly. If you don't have that available to you, oh, just a good warm day will do that. Now carefully watching to make sure that the water goes and scrubbing as I go so I'm cleaning. Always open the door jams and go inside and clean everything out there 
uh, we can discuss how the door jams are done. There is a way of doing the jams while we paint the car, and I've done that many times. But one of the best ways, of course, is to jam the, the doors with the base before you go ahead and paint the outside. Then you can easily come in and do the touch-up with the candy with a little intensifier and get those easily covered. I always do that before I do the color sanding. Then any overspray that gets on the outside gets sanded off. Now with a blow gun, blow all the water out of all the areas using a tack rag. Pack up all the lint that might be left from our final. Now we're going to put on the flow coat. This to me is the most fun part of the painting. What's the difference? Well, you can also change to our UFC 3.5 clear, which is our polyester modified flow clear. And instead of the 2.1.1, we go 2.1.1.5 on the reducer. Now I noticed some light spots that I didn't band often enough on these areas and so I mixed up a little candy with catalyst with intensifier in it and put it in a touch-up gun so I can go around now and do my touch-up to make sure that it matches everything else. As soon as I'm done with this I've already mixed my flow coats they're in the gun I'm ready to begin. First coat is a bond just wetting fast, just wetting, a little more gun distance than I normally use for flow coating because this is going to create the bond that is going to allow the other coats to stick without running. Very quickly put on the flows, just wetting. Don't hold the gun too far away because that creates a stuccoed effect. We don't want that to happen now after all the work we've done to smooth out this paint job to the point we're at doing the trunk, get all the edging, walk the sides like we always have, nothing changes. We do everything the same. We are that robot, fast, applying the bond. How many coats do we put on a final clear? We do a bond coat and two super wet coats. With the two coats that we put on after the candy and figuring that maybe we sanded a half a coat off during the color sanding, that gives us four coats of clear for the life of the job, and that's plenty. Now we begin the flow coats. Start slowing down. Look at how much closer I'm getting. I am wetting it out. I've changed the gun to a 1-4 nozzle needle combination and I'm wetting this baby out. The weight between coats is going to increase with the flow coats. Because of the slight amount of extra reducer, it takes a little more time to leave the film. Make sure you're doing the touch test. You don't want it stringing when you're pumping the clear on like this. This means it matches the old painter's saying, the very best paint job is one big run. That's what we're doing here. We're doing the one big run. This whole job is going to be like a piece of glass. So much fun at this point. You don't have to worry about getting the candy on even, but everything you've learned at this point, see the touch test? Touch it, sticky, no string. Ready for the last flow coat. Pump it on, pump it on. So much fun. Look at the gloss. And guess what? This is the way it's going to look tomorrow. It's going to have this same beautiful gloss. Now if we use the UFC 3.5 Flow Clear, we want to let it sit for 48 hours before we begin color sanding and doing our buffing because it has a longer cure time. But it also has a slightly amount of more gloss than our UC 3.5 does and longer time between coats because of the slowness of it. But what a beautiful clear it is. And it builds. It's a medium high solid in the 40% range. Of course, we're over reducing it a little bit, which also reduces the solid somewhat. Wet it out, wet it out. Look at the reflection. 
of me and that paint job. Get those rockers. With that bag and the gun, you can literally turn it upside down to get those rockers. Here we are the next day in the booth, and here we are outside the booth two days later, showing you that you can also color sand with dry paper. Here we're using 1200 grit to just see how well it's sanding. Keep that scuff pad handy because this is a time it's very important to also look for nibs, but also look at the grease from my hands from just touching it. See how important it is during the paint job to keep your hands off? We don't care now because this is the buffing stage. This is the time that we don't care if you lay your hand on it. It doesn't make any difference now. But use the power tools. Painters are telling me around the country that by using the power tools in the big flat areas that they're able to save about four hours in what used to be a 10 hour cut and buff, they're able to knock it down to six. And you gotta figure this in your pricing. You must get paid for the work that goes into this. It's fun though, starting to watch the job come around. Here's a new wet sanding tool from Dynabride that doesn't orbit, it just vibrates. So there's no chances of putting those tight little swirls in. I like to wet sand the final. Even if I do use dry to get close, I still like to come in with the 1200 grit, 1500 grit, and 2000 grit paper to do my polishing. Now here we are using a 3M cutting compound, their Perfected 3 system. You can also use the material from System 1, from Frecklia. There's many, many. Presta, many other good companies out there that make polishing compounds, but use the cut wool pads. The loop wool pads tend to cut or burn a little more than the cut wool pile. So look at your pad carefully and see if it's got loops in it or if the pile is cut. That's important. But look at how fast the shine comes back once you use the papers out to 2000 grit. The technology from Merca also moves you from 2000 to 4000 grit. And 3M just came out with a triazac system that moves to 3000 grit. This really helps bring that shine on fast. This particular clear buffs like butter though. Here we are using a convoluted uh, foam pad and using the machine glaze. This tells you just what kind of a job you've done. How well your polishing is going. Because this will give you the look of the final shine. But look at our reflection in there. It comes back quick. It's so much fun at this stage to start seeing the results of the effort and the labor that we've put into this job. They don't call it body work because it's not work. And they don't call it a paint job because it doesn't require a lot of expertise and know-how. And it is a job. You saw the work we went through. But it's fun. When you can do work like this, it's fun. Here we're trying a little mist shine just to see what we've got, take a look at it. You may find spots you have to go back over. We found down in these low areas that there was a haze. We hadn't gotten in there real well. Well, Dynabride makes a little three inch polisher and that works great for getting down in these tight spots. I use it all the time on motorcycles, getting around mirrors on the cars. When you don't want to take the mirror off, it has tremendous use. Here we are outside the booth. We've painted the bumpers, we put them on the car, we've installed our headlight doors, we got our grill in. This is our finished product. Looking good. Look at how that bumper disappeared, painting it to match. It's not so hideous anymore. Well, here we are, 10 working days later. And look what we've achieved. This beautiful candy apple paint job over three bases applied evenly throughout the car. We shared the secrets with you of what it takes to do this job. But the biggest secret of all is staying with the House of Color product line. Don't throw in intermixed products or other products around us, on top of us, below us. It doesn't work. Our system lives long term. It's been proven. We see jobs going 10 and 15 years and looking beautiful with minimal amounts of care. And the pride of workmanship was sticking with our system and using our methods 
will never go away. Your friends will be totally blown away by the work that you're doing. And best of all, customers will beat a path to your door. Well, I'm John Kosmoski, and I want to say thank you so much for watching. And remember, you can achieve results like this using House of Colors products.